-hmm. journalist and royal commentator. Hello, welcome to the show. Tell us, tell me, what has happened in the news with regards to Prince Harry and his celebrity therapist, Gabor Mate? Yeah, I think that this shocked a lot of people because this was one of the key marketing tactics that Harry and his publisher uh, and Mr. Mate's publisher utilized to push the book Spare. Uh, they did. Do you remember this? They did this one off and it was rec it, you had to watch it live. You could not purchase the video later. You couldn't watch the video later, but they did a sit down interview where Harry went further into how he felt like he was emotionally abused by the royal family uh, and just discussed some of the trauma he felt he experienced as a child. And, um, you know, it, it a lot of headlines came from it. I think that they financially deemed that execution a success because whether you'd pre-ordered Harry's book or not, you had to pay $20 at least to watch this live stream. And in doing so, you got another copy of the book Spare in case you needed something to make sure your table didn't fall over or something to like <laughs> shove in the leg of your table. I don't know why you need more than one copy of Spare. But Gaber um, has recently come out and said that he kind of regretted that experience. And what's so interesting is he believes that it was unethical for the publisher to require people to purchase to have access to that conversation. He said Harry felt the same way. And um, at the end of the day, uh, he regrets the fact that it wasn't a open conversation that anybody could access and that it was all just a kind of a, a marketing scheme by the publisher to blow up to exaggerate Terry's book sales. He, and, and I think that after he sat back and really thought about it, he realized that that's probably not something that they should have done. It was, again, I, I want to use the word unethical. I've just, I just lost your sound for a second, but it might just be on my end, hang on. Uh, I'm just going to check sound sound levels. I okay, probably safe. said okay. something really smart. Okay, it looks smart. like it is on my side. So okay. what I'm going to do is ask you another question while I sort out my headphones. Sure. <laughs> but, I mean, the first point I would make is that, yeah, it, interesting that it is a marketing tool. I guess it's called spare, so you could have lots of spare ones around the house. You put them under the table, as you say. That's a perfect there you marketing go. tool there. And um, who is to blame for this then? Is this Penguin Random House's fault? Why is it that everything that Harry and Meghan seem to do ends up being this taking advantage of everybody else kind of thing? Yeah, and no accountability. It's always someone else's fault. Because when I was saying, when I was like telling someone else about this story, they said, Harry has the power to say, I'm not comfortable with that. Or if we're going to do that, then we need to do another side conversation that maybe is done over Instagram Live. Maybe it's just a five minute conversation. Harry had the power to negotiate some other option there. So, um, I think you're right. It, it does seem like they, they lack taking accountability. It's always someone else's fault. Um, but another thing Mr. Matei said was that he, he got a lot of trolling and, and that he really regretted doing the interview because he did not like the negative feedback that he got online. And I think a lot of people are going to experience that type of criticism when associating themselves with Harry and Meghan. I mean, we're going to talk about South Park. We're going to talk about Family Guy. There's an element of parody associated with their brand right now. And I do think that brands and individuals should likely be hesitant and be very thoughtful before aligning themselves with these two people because there is a toxicity associated with them right now. And what is the ultimate objective? Is it a quick PR hit? I get that with the Kardashians. And there's a shamelessness with the Kardashians that kind of goes with, you know, near catastrophic car chases that probably didn't exist. Um, but if you are a legitimate brand like Spotify or Netflix, there needs to be real thought put into aligning yourself with these two. What is in it for you? And does the good outweigh the bad? And is the return on investment there, which Spotify at the end of the day said no?
Mm, yeah, well, that's it. And yet another business. There were so many different businesses that were not happy with them. Um, and I think one of the issues that many of us have, people are always, every single time I do anything about Harry and Meghan, which is not that often, but maybe once every 20 or so videos, uh, something about that. And people go, oh, what, you're obsessed. Why do you even dislike these people? You obviously, And I think the main reason, as I explain time and time again, and I'm going to have to explain again to people who are still angry in the comments and things, I think the main issue that people take is when people, I, I think people don't have a problem with success, particularly Americans like success. There's the American dream and they love to see people succeed. And in the UK as well, I don't think we have a huge problem with that. It's fine if you're successful. We loved the Queen. A lot of people did anyway. Uh, with Harry and Meghan, I think the issue is when people start to virtue signal and they start to get involved in, um, I guess, piggyback off of some of the social concerns of the day. And it's like, well, you guys are so far removed from any of these concerns. These are really serious issues, a lot of the things they talk about. And it's so clearly done for clout. So I do feel like they jump on these bandwagons. And with Gabor Mate, it was the mental health one. And that's very important, mental health, and it's important people talk about it. Uh, but, you know, Harry needs to be told that when he does things like complain about press intrusion from non-royals, and then the next Next minute, he's, he's you know when he's no longer a royal, he writes a book about uh, everyone else in his life and impinges upon their freedom. That it's hypocritical. So I just feel like if he's going to go to a therapy session, that stuff needs to be brought up. And I don't think it really was. It's all blaming everybody else. There's no blaming him. Um, and yeah, I mean, do you, do you think that's also part, a big part of the issue is that they're jumping on these social issues and they're not really exploring them in any real depth? Yes, but really quickly, what I'd say to you about that is you'd notice that their media strategy is to find people that won't push back. I think you, re I don't know if you remember the interview with Anderson Cooper, if you saw that, but Anderson Cooper's face when Harry says, why should he give up his title? Anderson Cooper's face clearly says, I have another question formulating, but why does yeah. Anderson Cooper not feel like he has permission to ask that question? You know, they have deals, they strike up these allegiances with certain media outlets like People Magazine, like their relationship with CBS, who you just talked about hypocrisy. CBS here in America is the only American outlet that showed pictures of Princess Diana dying in her car in Paris. Harry, uh, both Harry and William came out fighting after that happened, talking about how appalling and, and horrible it was that uh, an American media outlet would show their mother dying in the car, yet CBS is the only television network we see Harry continuously go back to, whether it's the Oprah wow. sit down or whether it's this interview with Anderson Cooper for 60 minutes. And so I do think that we should never, when we're digesting their interviews, think that they're, we're dealing with a serious journalist. Oprah didn't push back during that interview and say, no, seriously, I need an example of racism word for word and who was it? And you it's you can't just throw that out there. That's, that there's a mystery racist in the royal family because for the next 12 months, every time I went on TV and talked about the royal family, I was asked about it and I had to try to navigate that. Um, and it, it, that was unfair. And then he tells Tom Bradby that they never said that and it's unconscious bias, which is like, oh my gosh, give me a break. But I do think that hypocrisy in general when it comes to some of these campaigns and causes, them telling us that we need to be more environmentally friendly. In the last six months, Andrew, Harry has been to London. He then went to the Invictus Games. Pri pri privately, they traveled to the Invictus Games to Germany. Then they went to Portugal uh, to see Beatrice. At some point, they went to the Caribbean. Then we saw them exiting a private jet in Atlanta, Georgia. And just this weekend, Harry was in Austin, Texas. But I need to stay home and I need to worry about my carbon footprint. But Harry's jet setting. And I just don't think that they see how ridiculous it is that they will stand on a platform and talk down to us about certain issues while being guilty of those issues themselves. Yeah. And I heard as well, I don't, I don't know if this is actually confirmed, but I, I think it was on GB News where I heard this, um, so I don't know, but that he went from California to Colorado on a private jet for polo, which is already a game that is like so far removed from the most, most of our lives. We can't even imagine like the kinds of people in the upper echelons playing this game. And he forgot his like uh, costume, his kit. And so he sent the jet back to get the kit and then to come back to Colorado again, um, which is maybe that's made up. It was on GB News, but that just shows like even that that could be true. And we're not quite sure shows how far some royals really are from the rest of us. 
Right. It's called FedEx. Have somebody po throw that in the mail. <laughs> like, I don't really think yeah. you need an entire jet to get you your whatever your little club is called. I don't, uh, you know, I don't know if that's true either. If that is true, that is wild. But Harry does, as a as a toker and a smoker, he does strike me as somebody that might misplace his golf or his uh, his polo uniform. Yeah, I think I think that does sound like, like him. So in in this so in this this interview again like business business was the whole thing again have they burnt every business bridge i mean gabor mate is it, that that was that was business that was part of the book it was as you say making people buy the book twice i would be i would be mortified if i came to realize that people had to sign up twice to my membership or something like that by accident and i've had things where people have messaged me and said oh you know it's charged me and i didn't mean to buy it and I, oh, well here's a refund of course like, i don't want people to pay twice how much? Okay, so I've got two. Two. Hmm. I want to go to another question. Actually, do you know? I mean, how much did they make from the books, from Spotify, from Netflix in the last couple of years? I mean, I don't know exactly. I know that Spotify did not give them everything that what they the the contract initially stated because they didn't feel like they held up their end of the bargain. At the end of the day. If we count the Bizarre Christmas special featuring Elton John and Tyler Perry, I think they got a total of 13 episodes out of Harry and Meghan in a, in a two or three year span. So they were not paid out everything that they were contractually um, obligated to pay out because Harry and Meghan broke the contract in, in not executing what they agreed to do. Um, but I, I mean, they, they're, they're millions of dollars richer than they were when they left the royal family. They can afford every, they can afford every roll of toilet paper for their 16 bathrooms in Montecito. Um, but I don't know a, an exact number. And it's, I would honestly say it's none of my business because they're not technically working royals anymore. Man, imagine that. Like for anybody watching now, there's a thousand people currently in this, in this, watching this live. People will be listening later. It'll end up being tens of thousands, maybe hundreds, right? I don't think there's a single person among them who, given an opportunity by Spotify for like millions to make a podcast, would just not fulfill their duties over a period of two or three years and just come out with 13 pathetic episodes where you didn't even have to make them i get really annoyed about it i suppose as a podcaster in particular uh, and it's a little bit like I, I've, I gather that a lot of children's book writers are really pissed off with them because again it's just like they get pissed off with a lot of celebrities who go into children's books writing and it's a bit of a kerfuffle between the the traditional children's book writers and then like megan and all these people who want to corner in that market um well, and, and don't forget moment. megan wants yeah. to write about fatherhood in her ch in her children's book when not she's yeah. not talking to her dad but you're in in harry's not talking to his dad what do you two know about father fatherhood you just pushed the baby out of your body what do you two know about fatherhood it's like the irony that all of these people all they want to do is be a children's book writer and then here comes megan markle fresh from the hospital ready to you know release her fatherhood book and neither one of them are talking to their dad it, i'm and i'm a podcaster too and i'm a spotify i'm an and i'm an ambassador for spotify because i busted my butt i had an audience of zero and i worked my way up by creating engaging content finding people that were of interest to me and working for free for so long until somebody recognizes your value so i know exactly what you're talking about it's enraging it's appalling to imagine somebody handing these people so much money just for the association and then you know i mean harry sitting around talking to bill simmons who was an executive at spotify about wanting to get putin on the line or trump to talk to them about their childhood you are so unrealistic go you know start start small harry start small but it just gives you yeah. an idea of how delusional they are Delusional and entitled, I think, because again, like it's not like Megan was told, okay, look, you've, you're, we're going to give you these millions, but you're going to have to sit down, you're going to have to buy the recording equipment and like sit down and make your room all nice and uh, start messaging and emailing contacts and all these that you know she didn't have to do any of that, like record it, learn how to use recording, in, in all the different things, the programs, editing, uh, the marketing, the screen, the, the thumbnails or whatever it might be. She wasn't even all she was told is like you just have to turn up and like you'll have these amazing celebrity friends and that's it and they still didn't do it and that's why spotify that bill Sim was it simmons or Simons? he came out saying they're a bunch of fucking grifters 
Right. And, and, and if you think about their first pitch to us as an audience, the first pitch was, we're going to talk to real people with real problems or that are really making a difference in society. And that was what Spotify said that Harry and Meghan were going to produce podcasts with real people. And I thought that's kind of interesting, them going to some of these charities that they work with and saying, how did you get here? Who did you lose? You know, what inspired you to do this job? Why are you living a life of service? That, that is really compelling content. But instead, we had Megan interviewing Mariah Carey and Paris Hilton and then completely hijacking the interviews whenever she could to talk about herself. So it was such a far cry from what was initially a promise to Spotify and then what was promised to us. And other brands are watching. They're they're doing their own research when they're approached by Harry and Megan and the stories about Megan calling up higher ups and executives late into the night demanding changes to the podcast before it goes live while you have 17 different producers that work on your podcast that probably could have handled this that's going to turn some of these other brands away you know they're talking about harry and megan potentially moving to audible i mean jeff bezos has enough money to waste and and to throw around but I do think people like Audible are going to try to learn some lessons from Spotify and it might turn them away before they even, you know, before the ink's even dry. Yeah, I think so as well. And one of the things that we were going to talk about today is that Family Guy clip. And I'm going to see if my tech is up to it, if, if, we, can, if we can manage this with my super cool tech. So uh, I'm just going to show it. If, if anyone doesn't know, they, they basically did a South Park uh, Family Guy with the next to do. I don't know. Like, I didn't even know Family Guy was still going, to be honest. But I guess it is, like new episodes and things. Uh, and let's see. I'm going to click this button. Oh, there you go. And then I have to click this I believe I hope everyone can hear this wait oh no I'm not started at the beginning right here you are there's the butler and he's talking to Harry and Meghan Your millions from Netflix for no one knows what put it with the rest of them babe time to do our daily two hundred and fifty thousand dollars sponsored Instagram post for Del Taco I shouldn't have left the made-up nonsense Your million so um that made up nonsense, obviously, is the royals that Harry has left and he's now regretting having left. What was interesting, I thought, and I don't know if I'm just being conspiratorial here, is Meghan Markle is represented by WME Agency and so is Family Guy creator Seth MacFarlane. And it has been noted by some people on the internet that um, they go a little harder on Harry because it's Harry's left this thing and he's now ridiculous and the royal family and everything than they did on Meghan, a little bit different to South Park. What, what do you think? Well, I thought that they both looked frivolous. Um, mm. South Park was much more hostile towards Megan. That, there's, that's a no-brainer. Um, but I did think it still echoed just this idea of like what frivolousness. Like, what are you doing? What are you doing? Because when they left the royal family, they said, and, and, and it was kind of an, an aggressive statement. Remember, they kind of went head to head with the queen about how she did not own the word royal and um, they were going to they could live a life of service wherever they chose to live, uh, you know, whether it be within the royal fold or outside of the royal fold. Since they've left the royal family, we've seen doc docu series where they're just, you know, complaining podcast episodes where they're complaining and not even specifically on their own. Uh, Prince Harry went and sat down with Dax Shepard and did that armchair, I think it's called armchair quarterback with Dax and complained about the royal family. We're seeing not much of a life of service and a lot of look at me, look at me, please, and please feel sorry for me. And I, when I watched this clip, I wondered if a lot of their attempts at garnering sympathy and this victimhood thing that they wear so proudly, if they were trying to avoid things like that, if they wanted to avoid South Park and things like Family Guy by trying to get people worked up and feeling sorry for them. I mean, if so, clearly it's failed. But, mm. I, you know, I, I can't justify this woman who said that she's this fierce feminist all her life, all of a sudden 
you know, crying on Oprah saying like they were mean to me, they wouldn't share their lip gloss with me and they wouldn't give my kid a title while I'm, you know, while we lived in America. So I don't know. I, I just think that they've made so many mistakes that things like this family guy hit are going to continue to come. They've got to, and I hate to use the word rebrand because we use it so often when it comes to Harry and Meghan, but they have to work themselves out of the parody that they've become. Mm, yeah, I think you should use the word rebrand because the YouTube algorithm might think we're talking about Russell Brand and get some extra people in to watch. <laughs> I don't know if it actually works like that way, but um, and I should know, but I don't know. So, uh, yeah, I loved uh, speaking of what you were you know saying with regards to how she was talking on the podcast that like everything was just about her. That moment with Mariah Carey, because a lot of people haven't listened to the podcast. Mariah, Mariah Carey called her a diva, right? And she didn't take it well. It was a really weird thing, wasn't it? It was. And Megan had the power to make it whatever she wanted to. She was in control of that interview. She was getting heavily in control of the editing and the distribution. So she could have said a diva. Well, I don't compare to, nothing compares to you. Or, you know, she could have had so much fun with it, but she has become so um, hypersensitive to the way that the world views her. She will hate that Family Guy segment. She will absolutely loathe it. And she'll say that that's not a reflection of who she is, but I kind of think that it is. I, that's definitely Tig, the Tig, Megan. If you think about, she, I mean, g give her credit where the credit is due. She built a, a cool brand for young women with the Tig. She was selling ad space. She was accepting freebies, you know, so she could do a, a tutorial or a review on a blow dryer or mascara. You know, I think she specifically was reaching out to Bobby Brown Cosmetics, asking for free cosmetics so she could post about them on her blog. Um, so that is Megan. That at least it was Megan. Um, but she would absolutely loathe that description of her, and she would say that that's not who she is. And she's, you know, very sensitive right now as to what the way the world views her but she really never gives us an authentic view of who she is. Everything is so calculated. Like when she talks mm. about the palm trees holding hands in her backyard in the cut interview, <laughs> or when she talks about people dancing in the streets, like after Nelson Mandela was freed, these are things like she lays in bed at night and comes up with before she delivers it in the interview. Nothing's off the cuff anymore. And I think people get a sense of that. Mm, it's like if Gwyneth Paltrow married the the prince or something a little bit. It's, it's a bit of a Gwyneth Paltrow gloopy gloop. Is that bloop gloop? I don't I don't, I don't know. It's gloop, but but Megan gloop. would love that comparison. So <laughs> she, she says thanks. <laughs> I suppose she would. My issue, I think, and and I've said this before. So if anyone's listening later to this on the audio podcast, for example, and they're going, oh God, shut up. Just forward the next thirty seconds. But I've said this before. Um, I think people, it's to do with status. There are three main types of status. There's dominance, there's success, and there's virtue. A virtue is like the third one, right? Um, and I think people don't mind when somebody is so far above them in one of those status fields or whatever. So it, when it's the queen, for example, she's obviously much more dominant. And, and I suppose in what she does, she's more successful. But people don't care because we can't even compare to her. It's just like we don't yeah. even... like. There's no point even competing. She's this otherworldly thing. And as long as she doesn't sort of annoy us or say any political things, I know I'm talking about her in the present. I am aware she's dead before people shout at me. I know that. But, you know, I know she's sort of got away with that. When they come down to our level and we can actually compete, that's when there's a problem. And unfortunately, Meghan and Harry were maybe badly advised. Maybe they were jumping on something that was really popular at the time. And it's, I think, getting slightly less popular the last couple of years, which is the, the virtue signaling stuff. Because when someone from the royal family tries to compete with us for victimhood, that's when we start to go. If he'd just gone around being, hey, I'm a rich guy and now I live in America and I'm going to the Caribbean, we'd be like, good on you, you know, hanging out with Kanye West and buying like expensive stuff. We'd be like, oh, there's Harry reading about him in a magazine doing some rich people stuff. Who cares? It's when he started saying, oh God, I'm such a victim. And Megan started saying, I'm such a victim. And the rest of us are like, and there's this this scene, again, people skip another 30 seconds. I do, do apologize because I've said it before. There's a scene in that book, as you'll remember, where he's in Eton and he's sitting there his friends were doing some drugs and clearly trying to do drugs without him but he was like whoa what are you guys doing sort of tried to go and he crashed their party a little bit and they were like oh god harry's here again that's how i read it anyway and he's looking out the window and he's having a weird conversation with a fox 
And he's saying, oh, God, everybody out that window is so lucky compared to me inside this prison that I'm in. And it's like, mate, you are in the richest, most prestigious, privileged place you could possibly be in in the world. I do understand that comes with some problems. I do understand you don't have as much privacy as you'd like. But the people that you're having a go at out in Staines and uh, the areas around Eton where it's not actually so nice and people are trying to put food on the table, those are the people who are pissed off at his lack of um, willingness to look at himself and that's what Gabor Mate should have had him doing if he wasn't or if they weren't all just having to be yes men exactly and I I mean in the states I think to your point one of the biggest issues we had with Harry and Meghan was that they came over here and immediately started interfering in our politics you know, a Megan calling up senators saying, hi, oh. this is Megan, the Duchess of Sussex. Them sitting down during ABC's ABC Network's Time 100 special on a bench, I think, in their backyard in Montecito. And blatantly, I shouldn't say blatantly, underlyingly suggesting that everybody should vote for Joe Biden. You know, it, it was strange and it felt like, A, you guys just got here. B, you're a, a prince of a foreign country. And C... <laughs> Megan has been given the platform she has because of who she married. And people are really in an anti nepo baby nepotism. You know, people are in a really nasty space. I mean, with Hunter Biden and everything going on, I think people are kind of resentful of some of these individuals that have been given opportunities because of who they're related to or who they married or who they know. And, you know, again, with the Spotify, they didn't work their way up to that. They were just handed it. I think a, a lot of these, a lot of the, the just disenchantment in the states when it comes to them, aside from the fact that they exaggerate everything, uh, you know, near catastrophic car chase. What? No, there's, what are you talking about? Uh, it's the fact that they didn't earn what they have. And then they talk down to you, despite the fact that they didn't earn that position. You know, why should you tell me who to vote for? You just got here. Who are you? Mm -hmm. Megan, you've been living in Canada. Um, you know, it was. it's just hard to digest. Yeah, and the whole point of the royal family is that they don't give political opinions and they're not supposed to sway things. And people sometimes when they're really desperate, they really don't want something like Brexit to happen. They start to hope or reach out and say, oh, the Queen's going to interfere without really thinking about what that would mean for democracy. Like, yes, you would get to yeah. have the vote you want and that's great. But at what cost? Because it would mean that a, a monarchy but as Family Guy said, the made-up thing, has actually influenced your politics and your lives, which is insane, and that can't happen. So absolutely no. bonkers that she would then go over there and get involved. And it does seem to be that we do live in a world right now. I feel I feel like this is passing, but it, and I might be wrong about that, but there were a good sort of five or six years where people were able to play the media in such a way that it was, you know, form themselves as victims, say, oh, God, I, I, all these difficult things are happening to me. But we still watch movies where, you know, the hero in the movie never lets anyone realize that he's down because because or she he or she is like they're so uh, they don't want to burden other people. They don't want to show off about being a victim. We still watch those people and root for those people. So I think there's something intrinsically human about disbelieving those who are constantly moaning and saying how difficult their lives are. If I ever say, oh, God, I've had a bad day. I always say to people, I'm sure you did as well. I'm sure you've had a difficult work day. I mean, everyone does. Again, everyone watching this right now, I'm sure, has had a, their own struggle struggles, their own difficulties every day. That's something that Harry just doesn't seem to be aware of. And then we end up in this ridiculous situation where they believe their own hype, celebrities want to be around them. And you've got like woman whose dad worked and married with children and was in suits or something, and guy who wore a Nazi uniform and doesn't seem to have much intelligence is lecturing huge foreign nation of 350 million people about who they should or shouldn't vote for and like ha and not one bit in their heads going maybe this isn't actually because i would be thinking maybe i'm not the guy to tell america where to vote and it doesn't even cross their minds so i don't know tell me this though so what what happens now for them did south park and now family guy just kill off their business ambitions uh or, or what do they do now i think all money right now is in Meet Me at the Lake, which is their, well, which is a, this story is like misreported all the time. They didn't buy the rights to this book. Netflix purchased the rights to this book for them. 
they didn't i don't know whether they didn't have the money to cough up or netflix was like we have got to have a win so we're going to make this we're going to have to make another investment in these two because we can't just have if harry and megan walk away from netflix and only the harry and megan documentary are a analytical success for them that's a fail you know that is a huge fail um so meet me at the lake is on the horizon they purchased netflix purchased the rights to this book for harry and megan's r12 team there's a parent that dies in it you know nice and morbid nice and morbidly uh, you know attached to yeah. to harry in that way the you know the writer's strike recently ended so they probably are moving at a faster pace than they were a month ago however the actor strike is still happening here in the states so this is not a project that's going to be quickly executed um could it make megan a power player behind the scenes which is what she does aspire to be she does she has admired oprah forever you know i do think that she would like to be able to say she produced this successful film on netflix and see what other opportunities come her way because of that but that's not going to happen tomorrow with the actor strike in play and um with them probably struggling to find people that are open open to will to work with them willingly because they officially do have a reputation of being difficult to work for they they rolled through multiple producers on their documentary for netflix about themselves um there were the reports of megan contacting people late in the game trying to make changes at spotify and there's valentine lowe's revealed bully report out of kensington palace uh, we never got to see the final results of that but they do have a reputation of being difficult to work with difficult to work for archwell just in general a revolving door of ex-employees and i think that people are going to not necessarily jump at the opportunity to work for them or with them is it true that i've just suddenly had this memory that people at the uh, in in the palace, were staff there were were in tears because of how she treated them, or is that one of those things that was overblown? No, Harry wrote about it in Spare. I was like, Harry, what are why are you putting this out there? You're literally legitimizing so many complaints about your Whoa. wife. Harry what did he writes say? I don't about remember. it in Spare too. Pardon? What did he say? I don't remember. He he did say that there were employees with their hands in their face crying at their desks. And he was trying to say that they I don't I don't know what his interpretation was, that they just couldn't keep up with this, you know, Hollywood fast paced, you know, uh, independent woman. Or um, I don't know how he was trying to justify it. But if you knew about Valentine's Valentine Lowe's re revelations about the bullying allegations and then you saw what Jason Knath had written in emails that, that Prince William inevitably saw and why he um, pursued a, a conversation with Prince Harry that inevitably turned violent, broken dog bowl. You're thinking, oh my gosh, you just basically admitted that, that something was inappropriate, that, that, that there was some sort of abuse there. Wow. Yeah, I mean, it, it really sounds like she either believes her own hype or has some sort of narcissism. I throw that word around lightly. I'm not, I, I'm not qualified to know, but I'm just, I just find the two of them, their lack of self analysis, quite astounding. And yet, it sort of makes sense, at least for Harry, when you grow up in that kind of bubble where everybody tells you how wonderful you are, but also you are the spare. I think that can cause all kinds of torments um, it, within them. But really bizarre to admit to that as well. She's obviously quite a difficult person and. I can see that they they'll want this movie to work, but I I guess if it's a really good movie, people might forget that it's them and just watch it. But it feels like I mean, you and I talked the other day just by messaging about what their plan is now and where are they? You know, have they changed tack a little bit? Um, but this movie again is another hint at Harry's difficult past, and it's another push for victimhood. It seems to me, which is just not working at all. Do you see anywhere where they're going to, you know, any point where they stop trying to mine us for, for for pity and actually try and impress us with something? 
Well, I mean, I think she thinks she impresses us all the time, if I'm being blatantly honest with you. I mean, the the look on her face through the Hertz window when she was in that gold dress said that we should be impressed with Meghan Markle that day. But you know what I think is interesting about your idea of this period in time where you're right, there is, there is this phase that might be ending where we, um, where we, put people that are victims on a pedestal, that we amplify voices of people that are, and maybe not even real victims, but just willing to complain. If you look at TikTok's algorithm, which I don't because I'm not necessarily, I, I just, TikTok scares me. But if you look at some of the studies around TikTok, people that are sobbing on TikTok, doing some of those confessional videos, like, major percentages, they are thrust in front of people on the algorithm. I don't know who at TikTok decided that's the definition of success. So they're going to make sure that video is seen. But if you have a video on TikTok where you are crying, you're having a breakdown, you're sad, that is a video that the algorithm will push. So there, there's something bigger going on where we are rewarding these people. And and I hope that it's the end of it because that's not the definition of the country I was raised in. The definition of the country I was raised in was tomorrow's a better day. We're going to pray on it, you know, you know, sit, sit up well, straight and keep moving because, you know, to, yeah. I, I, it's just I not get, the definition of what I grew that. up in. I want to get in on that because, OK, if we're going to be really conspiratorial here, it might make sense that a Chinese company... Uh, that has admitted it basically spies on Western citizens would want America to celebrate that kind of weakness as opposed to uh, a brave front. So that's that's an interesting point I've, I've actually heard people make before about TikTok. They are fashioning a very particular type of American in particular, but also the rest of the West uh, and what we should look up to. And that is really, really scary. While the rest of the world, like Russia and, and China and other places, look at like, what is that? Look how pathetic these guys are. Uh, they don't. They can't even stand up for themselves. They can't, as you say, just say, "Come on, tomorrow's a better day. Let's keep going." The other thing to say, though, about that with regards to TikTok is that maybe that's not necessarily people that you look up to. It's people that you want to watch to feel better about yourself. And Megan has created mm -hmm. that kind of car crash, both literally and metaphorically. Now, that uh, sentiment where we watch to feel better about ourselves, and that's not where you want to go to from having been a royal marriage and all of these things. So, it's a really complicated one. Um, and that that kind of I think people are watching it because the other one is those YouTube videos. I don't know if you've seen them. I'm sure people might start searching. It. I don't want you to if you do, but uh, I have no friends. There's loads of videos now where extremely attractive young men or women write like I have no friends, and there's a picture of there's a thumbnail of them crying, and they get millions of views because everybody's looking going how can this young attractive person have no friends i feel sorry for them i empathize with them but i also feel good about myself because i have at least two friends and i can you know so <laughs> i don't know if that's if, if that means it's actually a good path for megan but i think that's what's tricked them megan and harry into following that path and it's been a huge mistake because people don't want that from their royals you're, I mean, I, you're so right, because when I started this, because I have people all the time that will send me old videos of me defending Meghan Markle, and I'm like, yeah, that was me defending Meghan Markle, because I started off as a Meghan Markle fan, like everybody else. Like, And I've developed as a human being. I've seen the light. I've seen the truth. And now I'm where I'm at. It's called evolution, people. But, you know, I loved her. I completely lived vicariously through her. She was on trash television. Do you know what quality Hallmark movies are? I can make them in my basement with my iPhone, okay? The scripts are predictable. I can say the words out of their mouths before they do without the closed captionings on. Every, you know, you know exactly who they're going to fall in love with. You know, it's timed to a T. There's no tongue kissing. It is bland. It is boring. She went from Hallmark actress to princess in real life. It is amazing what she accomplished. And women like me absolutely were watching her going, oh my God, this is amazing. I'm just, I want to spend every day as Meghan Markle. I cannot believe the life, the path she's chosen on purpose. She had everything in the world. You know, you're, you can't tell me that she couldn't have moved over to Frogmore and done her own thing and, been, you know, distanced herself from William and Catherine if she didn't like them. Uh, you know, she had so much opportunity that I think she just blew. 
And you're right. That is why I'm fascinated with her because I just am appalled every step of the way. The way she was gyrating at the Beyonce concert around the 26th anniversary of Harry's mother's death. I mean, twerking the way, I mean, Muhammad Fayed had died that day. Dodie's dad had died that day and Megan was dry humping the seats at SoFi Arena to Beyonce. And I just thought, my God, how the mighty have fallen. What a brilliant life she could have had. Uh, but she has chosen to burn it in a blaze of glory because she'd rather come over here and talk to Paris Hilton on a podcast. I mean, I just can't comprehend it. And that's exactly why I walk, I watch picking my jaw up off the floor, trying to figure out how somebody could trash an, op an amazing opportunity like that that was given to them. I think they should have just owned it as you know and just been like hey I've become this princess here's all my nice fashionable stuff because she obviously likes that stuff it's not like she doesn't enjoy that side of things the glamour and the glitz and just really appreciate it and just thought to herself every day my god I'm so lucky to have this position that I have and I'm just going to take it with grace I've got millions of adoring fans for nothing because I just fell in love with this guy if you know if she actually fell in love but instead she she needed more she wanted intellectualism uh and, and, and didn't righteousness like that she wasn't give, given her way it was that she was not given her way and that there were rules that she couldn't bend and so she she couldn't you know she was basically I know she had brothers and sisters but toward step you know step half brothers and sisters but for the most part, she grew up an only a spoiled only child, you know, and because her half sisters were older. But for the most part, she was given everything she wanted. And then all of a sudden she wasn't and she couldn't she doesn't she's a rule breaker. Yeah, which which to be fair, I usually like. I like a renegade. I like someone who goes in and usually. breaks the rules. Yeah, but I, I just I think if you're going to join the royal family, if you're going to get all the perks, and the perks are astounding again compared to people who have to get you know put food on the on the table for their families and things like that, and you're going off just wearing this amazing stuff. Nobody would even be saying how oh you're taking too many private jets if she wasn't going for all these virtue points by talking about the climate and everything like that. They've spoken out about the British press, uh, but there are rumours that she'll move back here. To Britain, that is. That's where I am. You're, you're in the States, of course, for anyone listening or watching or whatever. Um, do you think she ever will? Because a lot of people are saying she, she just won't ever step foot back in the UK again. I don't think she will. I don't think she sees the value in it. She's had she's found everything she could possibly take from there. You know, she took the the, the most eligible bachelor. Um, I think that she has gotten everything out of that country that she possibly can, and there's nothing in it for her anymore. And she doesn't want to feel, or be, she don't want, doesn't want to be humiliated. And she doesn't want to feel rejected, which she would if she spent, <clears throat> if she spent more time over there. I think if Harry is truly looking for a space over there, it's because Maybe it has something to do with his visa, the mystery visa that we can't get details on. It might require him to have a household over there. Um, it could be because Harry doesn't want to lose his position as chancellor of state. Um, and it could be simply because he's homesick, because I, I've heard that he is homesick um, and that he does not have a lot of real friends over here. But I do think it's interesting. There's a celebrity blind item blog here called uh, crazydaysandnights.com. It's an entertainment attorney who anonymously posts things that he hears around town on this blog. And he said, watch to see if Harry only puts the house, if he gets one in the UK, watch to see if he only puts it in his name. If so, we, sh we might be able to consider it an escape for him in case you know what hits the fan. Uh, and he needs, you know, he needs to to find other another place to live. Wow. Well, that's the thing. People are always saying, you know, will they, won't they break up at some point? It's got to end when she realizes she can't get anything more out of him. But then if there is a divorce, does everything else fall away for her? Uh, quite possibly. Um, I, you were you were saying to me that she at the moment is on this sort of where 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 is she now? Uh, she's was it Atlanta she's been to with all these photo opportunities. What's she what's she up to? I have no idea. So Harry Harry was just in Austin, um, and he was with her in Atlanta. 
So I don't know where she's currently at, but we did see her exit a plane, a private plane in Atlanta. Crazy Days and Nights reported that she called the photog <laughs> that, that snapped those photos. Um, so Crazy Days and Nights had reported that. But um, I don't know. Tyler Perry's in Atlanta. Perhaps she had some meetings with him. Tyler Perry is the godfather to Lilibet, the child they bizarrely named after Queen Elizabeth, the head of the racist institution, allegedly. Um, so maybe she is asking Tyler Perry for some counts, career counsel. He is one of the most powerful individuals in the industry. Maybe she's auditioning for Medea number 467 at the movie. I don't know. Um, but interesting that they were to land in Atlanta, except Atlanta, because of the tax breaks, is a hot spot for filming. Atlanta and New Orleans, Louisiana, they, they give amazing tax breaks. So perhaps they were looking for locations to shoot, you know, the, 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 new, the upcoming Netflix movie. I, I just don't know. But interesting that they were landing in Atlanta. When I hear Atlanta and Meghan and, and Harry and them wanting to show off about their virtues and stuff, my mind just goes to Martin Luther King and the museum and everything. I'm amazed there aren't loads of photos, the opportunities of them hanging around the Martin Luther King Museum and seeing all of those bits and pieces. And I was there recently for a podcast in Atlanta. And it's quite an interesting um, and, and amazing place and uh, didn't also didn't, didn't get photo opportunities of me around the Martin Luther King. But I bet she was thinking of of that. I don't know. Um, we can't, we're, we're in the sort of last quarter of this, we can't we can't not mention Israel at all. I heard you uh, speaking on your wonderful YouTube channel with Tessa a little bit about uh, Israel and the Royals and things like that. That's, oh, what's the name of your, of the, of the podcast for everybody, by the way, your YouTube channel? The Edge of Royalty. But I'm also, I don't want to just promote that because I'm a hustler. Andrew, I, I apologize. I also have the To Die, D-I, To Die for Daily podcast as well. Okay, okay. Well, everyone will have to, and I'll, I'll push again at the end for people to go to that and there'll be links below. Okay. Um, but yeah, so what Tessa was saying, which was interesting, is that Charles was speaking, I'm, I'm just thinking about how they're reacting in the Israel-Palestine conflict. Charles spoke of acts of terrorism when talking about Hamas, something the BBC refused to do, refused to call the Hamas terrorist terrorists. Um, you were telling me something about his grandmother that might make him maybe uh, re relate to the Israeli cause in some sense. Well, yeah, I mean, his, his grandmother um, on Prince Philip's side actually would hide Jewish families uh, and she would protect them um, during the, uh, I can't remember what year it was, but when they, one of the years that they had, um, of course, all of, I space on everything now, but Charles has, a, I think, a deep interest in this, not only because of the murder of Louis Mountbatten, which was absolutely devastating to him. That was his mentor, basically a father figure, and that was absolute terrorism by the IRA. But then Prince Philip's mother is buried in Israel and is considered almost saint-like because of the way she would hide families from the Nazis and protect them. Um, I think that it was crucial that the royal family respond to this and instantly because I do think that there are a lot of people that are fearful of World War III and the royal family is that stability that all that people have always counted on to bring them some sort of comfort. But I also think we're hearing now that William Morris Endeavor is asking Harry and Meghan not to, to really get involved. But I also think it is good that Harry and Meghan said something within the days following the kings. Well, it was the prime minister that said something, then the king uh, in protocol, the king reacted, Prince William and Catherine reacted. And then surprisingly, Harry and Meghan waited and, and released a statement as well. But we've got the crown coming up and we have seen pictures of Harry's character in the Nazi costume. In the book, Harry blatantly says that he's dressed up for Halloween as Hitler. He had to perfect the Hitler mustache. And this, he's got to step out and he's got to speak out against anti-Semitism because the crown could introduce such a horrible decision and such a hateful um, joke 
to an entire new generation of people that had no idea about it. And so I was thankful that the royal family spoke out. And I was even thankful that Harry and Meghan said something because I do wonder if there will be backlash in the coming weeks and months if that is included in the crown. We've seen pictures, it was reported by People, I think it was report, People Magazine, I think it was reported by a few other outlets that this storyline is expected to be featured in season six, maybe the second part in the month of December. Um, and I, you know, if he, I just, I just fear what could, like, could this be the end of that brand if, if people get really up in arms over it? And now if it doesn't show up, I'd say, oh my God, they've got way more power at Netflix than I could have ever imagined. Because yeah. if it doesn't show up and we've seen the photos, that means somebody made a call and it was removed. Mm, man. See, my, my first feeling about that is that Again, just sticking on brand here is that not not Russell Brand again, but uh, just on, on brand for me, I suppose, is that it's a stupid thing that he did and it was very offensive. But it was also a, di a bit of a different time when people were a bit more open about being deliberately offensive. A royal should never, ever have done it, but he did it. No. But it's also another reason why I just don't want to hear lecturing from him about our moral duties. Again, like we let rock stars do whatever they want, basically, to a, to a, to a degree, right? Where they can misbehave and do stupid things. And people don't really bring it up that that often because that's that's the personality that they've made for themselves. I think it's when these people are acting all victim-y that when we're like, then we're like, mate, you, you turned up in a, in a Nazi uniform to a party dressed up properly as Hitler. I mean, that is absolutely outrageous. And in the, in the modern climate, you know, that's the kind of thing people get cancelled for. So I, I agree that in the climate, given how it, we, we treat, what did you say? Like even comedians, I remember like mentoring somebody <clears throat> 10 years ago and saying, if you want to talk like that on social media, you need to add the word comedian to your bio because that's the only thing that, you know, that's the only way people will forgive you. Yeah. You can't even do no. that today. I mean, you no. can't even, not, not comedians can't even get away with stuff like that today. Oh, man. I think the problem often is is the comparisons and stuff. I, I'm Jewish myself, so I and I, rem I remember the, the Harry Nazi thing, and I was a bit offended, and I thought, okay, well, I'm offended. So, I'm, you know, people do things that are offensive, and I've got to live with that. But then you start to see other people getting cancelled for being maybe less provocative against another minority. So you start to, in your head, you can't help it, play this kind of victimhood Olympics. So suddenly you're going, well, hang on a minute. Why is it all right for them and not for us? And then suddenly we're in a position where we're arguing that. So Jewish people, for example, didn't used to be, I, mean, I can't speak for everyone. I, I I would like to be the leader of the Jews, but I, I'm apparently not. But, but you know, we didn't used to mind that much if non-Jewish people played Jewish people in films. In fact, I quite liked it. I liked the idea that this guy is probably not an anti-Semite because he's getting into the headspace of a Jewish person. Oh, that's quite nice. And oh, maybe he's learning about my culture and my background. Isn't that nice? But then suddenly now the Jewish community don't like it because every other community has has done this whole like, oh, Scarlett Johansson can't play a trans person and this person can't do that and nobody can act anymore. So now we're all getting uppity about things. But if I really think about it in the scheme of like when that was the Prince Harry thing, I think it was bad, pr very stupid. As a But, he, but I forgive him for that. He's a, he was a teenager, I think, and he's really stupid anyway. So I don't hate him for that, but he could get absolutely killed for this. On your um, on your channel, I mean, Tessa seemed to feel, and, and that's what's good about your show, I think, is that you, you're very different, I think, politically, and you have these different points of view. I think that's really good. People should have plurality of opinion. They should be able to disagree. Um, she felt that Kate was partly to blame for the Nazi uniform. What do you think? Oh, I couldn't. I'm still recovering from that commentary. I'm still <laughs> Andrew. Yeah. I was like, what do you mean? I do not agree. So the reason that that came up was because Prince Harry claims in spare that he was encouraged to wear that costume by William and Catherine. And, you know, just to kind of repeat something you said earlier, like no accountability. Who can we who else can I blame? It seems to be like their whole strategy. I don't think for a second that William and Catherine had anything to do with this costume, especially Catherine. I mean, Catherine was probably worried about what 
cat ears she was going to wear that night. What, you know, like how much cleavage was she showing in her Halloween costume? She didn't care about Harry's costume. And I don't, I certainly don't think that she would encourage him to wear something so stupid. Uh, I j that blew my mind. I was like, Tessa, where are you coming from left field with the commentary? I don't think at all that Catherine had anything to do with that. And I, I'm I'm totally speaking off, you know, without my notes in front of me yet again. But I think I researched this after I read that in the book. And I found a piece by Andrew Pierce for the Daily Mail. Uh, and it was at, written at the time of the, the, the costume scandal. And there was in that piece no mention of Catherine being at that party. So I would argue that I'm not even sure Catherine was involved in that evening. Mm, so there you go. That, I, I, yeah, it is mad. It's yet another, as you say, another example of blaming other people. It could be that they said to them, it said to them, yeah, go on, mate, go on, do that stupid thing. Are you believing that? Maybe they were just trying to get him off the phone. What'd you say? Maybe they were just trying to get him off the phone. Like, yeah, yeah, whatever. <laughs> I did get that impression. You know, I was alluding to that before when he was in in the book, and there's there's this drug scene. Um, it's like they he kept sort of. Do you remember this? I don't know if I'm now re like remembering it differently to how I re when I actually read it. But it seemed to be like every time it was his supposed friends were like he would wake up and be like, oh, they've all gone without me, and then he'd sort of go, hey guys, what are you doing in here? And I, I got the real distinct impression they they didn't really want him there which i suppose is quite sad actually but it just shows again a lack of awareness and it could have been similarly william and kate just going like oh mate just just please leave me alone but yeah wear the nazi uniform whatever you want <laughs> it could be i just had somebody leave me a comment on my youtube channel though saying that they disagreed with harry's retelling of his youth that they spent a lot of time with him at bars mm. yes he was cornered off he was roped off in his own area but that p locals really respected him in prince william's space there weren't photographers waiting for him outside when he'd go into some of these smaller neighborhoods of course when you go to london and you go to these swanky vip bars where inside are are who, who the Beckhams or whoever was popular, the, the members of five, I don't know who was popular back then. But, you know, if, of course, if you hang in those spaces, there are going to be photographers waiting for you outside and any celebrity D list to C list, you know, is going to know that there might, they might have their you know, photograph taken that night. But she says she would see them a lot in her neighborhood bars that it was almost a sanctuary for them. There was another bar that would completely shut down for him in, in her neighborhood. No photographers outside or paparazzi and that there they would have little roped off areas and that they were joyful, laughing, completely at ease, enjoying themselves. And she said that reading back on t some of his stories of his youth, she felt like they were very insincere because she witnessed them and she witnessed witnessed she was there for a lot of those mm. nights and she just thought oh my gosh it's cool that he's over there he looks like he's having a good time but i'm not going to go say hi i'm not going to try to get a picture with him because they understood the that they were kind of in an unfair position born into this role uh they liked them and they respected their family yeah i th i think so and it also everything that he's thinking about is is remembered through a prism of victimhood and hurt. And we do remember these things differently uh, when we've been hurt. It's like if you get a divorced couple and you try and ask one of them what happened and another what happened, you get a totally, totally different story and both seem true to the person. And, you know, he's gone through some hard times. He is, I do want to give him that benefit of the doubt. I always say towards the end of a long hour of, of sort of me moaning about these people that, uh, you know, they're not the worst people in the world. They're just really annoying and hypocritical. And one of the main aspects of that is the fact that he complained and complained about his privacy and i don't even mind you know the south park thing of like oh it's his privacy tour he's going out oh privacy you know for me it's that he instantly within a moment wrote a book that invaded and impinged upon the privacy of everybody else from prince now king charles in his underwear doing a headstand like the king needs to be imagined doing that to chelsea davy who he literally says didn't want any of this 
pre press in invasion and then writes pages and pages and pages all about her to the woman to whom he lost his virginity, who was very easily recognisable just from the way he'd written about her. The book is filled. It's almost like it should be called Harry's Revenge. It should not be called Spare. This is Harry's Revenge yeah. on the world, but people who didn't do it to him. It's not like he's going after the, the, pho the photographers and the paparazzi. He's going after people who were just part of his life and who trusted him. And I think that's one of the, the, the saddest um, the saddest parts of it. Um, Wait, okay, I'm just I, just, I know on, you're gonna, on, yeah. you're trying to keep me up, but can I just say really quickly too? If you read Britney Spears' new book, she mm. does go after the media and she does go after specific individuals. She says, "Diane Sawyer, I would never speak to her again, and this is the way she made me feel, and and this was such a violation of who I was." She goes after Ryan, everybody's favorite host, Ryan Seacrest, for some questions he asked her. I did. I do feel sympathy for Britney Spears. I do, and sometimes, like when Megan starts trying to play that game, I'm like, why don't you just go spend 15 minutes with Britney? You know, like talk to Britney. But in you really did feel and get a sense of, and she gave you some really clear examples, Britney, in the book of um, the the way that the media violated her her life. And I don't know who the ghostwriter was, but I feel like it would have benefited Harry to be involved. More so with Britney's ghostwriter because she delivers it better than he did when it came to defining the kind of cage she felt like she was in uh, under that media scrutiny and how unfair they, they treated her. Yeah, well... I had on this show one of my heroes growing up, which was Robbie Williams, the singer. He's not as as well known in America. Oh, you oh know, I loved you know him. him. I loved him. I was surprised you knew Five as well. So you know the British pop scene. Oh, yeah. baby, when the lights go out. I was in Arkansas rocking out to that song at like age 13. <laughs> <laughs> what a song that is well Robbie's the best as well and I got, I've gotten friendly with him through this doing, doing this channel which is the best maybe the, apart from the lovely subscribers and listeners maybe the best thing to happen to me from, the, from this YouTube thing and everything and Robbie used to live or, or Rob as uh, those, those in his friendship group get to call him Rob used to live next to Britney and he said like you know he was used to this kind of mad press intrusion and stuff and he was used to that and then the Britney stuff was just another level like he's never seen anything like the, the way they would which was nice for Rob I suppose in a sense he didn't say like he wasn't reveling in Britney's misfortune but I suppose it was nice for him yeah. because he got to have some privacy because I, I guess everybody probably wanted to just be near Britney and then okay she can take the heat off of us from if we live in this this neighborhood well, and, and Britney's actually, I'd have to look up the exact quotes, but over the years, Britney has said that she really related to Princess Diana. And it's kind of appalling that we allowed what happened to Britney to happen to her so quickly after the death of Diana. You know, Diana died in 1997 and the chaos around Britney really exploded in 2007. But everybody did go, oh, hands up. Oh, we really need to rethink our, our morals and our strategy here after the death of Diana. Remember George Clooney holding a press conference saying that they were going to change the way media worked after the death of Diana. Madonna standing there at the MTV Awards giving us, she's about to, to in, it, she's about to enter the guys that sing she was introducing the guys that sing Smack My Bitch Up. <laughs> Before she does that, yeah, she yeah. gives a, a speech about Princess Diana and her death. It was very bizarre, but, you know, it's it, it, pop culture at the time. I guess it worked. But everybody was like, we're going to change the way this works. And then, you know, several years later, Britney's accidentally running over people with, you know, a, 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 in a McDonald's drive through because they're swarming her car. And it's just like all, you know, Diana all over again. <laughs> So that doesn't surprise me about uh, Robbie, your your friend Robbie Williams, um, and how, you know I I I don't even think Harry. I've not even seen Harry in those, and I and I don't want to. I don't want to see Harry in those types of positions. But the way they exaggerate everything, all of their complaints, the way that they. Um, say that there was a high speed car chase the way that they accuse somebody of racism and then pull it back you know it's it's hard to take them seriously now because we have seen we have seen the high speed car chase it was your mom you know we've seen paparazzi harass catherine the princess of wales 
that you had to use footage of the paparazzi harassing Catherine in your documentary while talking about Megan being harassed because the footage just didn't exist. And it's the talking down to us and, and just jumping on the trending topics of the day and become deciding you're going to be a martyr for that for the next 24 hours or until it expires. But it's also just, um, just being, just being over the top about things that, aren't true. I mean, I don't want to use the word lying, but but it does some of their the things that they accuse people of, they they seem like lies. Yeah, I think so too. Um just for to reference for people, Smack My Bitch Up was the prodigy. He um only died recently, unfortunately, um sadly. Yeah, I think last year. Um very sad, tragic circumstances. So I'll, I'll move on from that quickly. And for those in the in the yeah, comments going, you- oh I I look I, I love Robin Williams. It's, we're not talking about uh, another sad case, Robin Williams. We're not talking about him. We were talking about Robbie, uh, very similar names. And I wonder if that's why Robbie didn't, his career didn't quite take off in the same way in America as it did in the rest of the world because of the closeness in names between Robin and Robbie. Um, in the next few weeks, the, is it the next few weeks when, when um, what's it called? The Crown actually comes out. And that's, that's going to be big, big news again, isn't it? The whole Harry Meghan stuff. Yes, in two weeks, yeah. Oh, we'll have to get you back on to talk all about the reactions and stuff to that. Um, right. Tell us again where you want to send people. So Tessa, Dr. Tessa Dunlop and I are at the Edge of Royalty on YouTube. And my podcast is To Die, D-I, like Diana, To Die For Daily. To Die For Daily dot com is where you can find me. And although it sounds morbid, the name means to live every day with your heart on display, like Princess Diana. No, oh, that is the antidote to the, vi- the victimhood of the royals and you know the Meghan and Harry stuff. That's that live every day. I would encourage everybody watching both to live every day like that, and also to go and check out those channels. We'll put them in the description. Please do because Kinsey is very very impressive. Kinsey Schofield, everybody. Uh, I I a fountain of knowledge about the royals, and we, we I will try and convince her to come back on the show. Please everybody also hit that like button because that probably helps it or something helps the video helps the channel and all those things. Share this on social media if you found it of interest and keep on watching because we want you watching all the time just keep on keep on going